The liver, how long can one man possibly talk about the anatomy of the liver for? <laughs> Which is, yeah. Um, so, let's have a look at the anatomy of the liver. We've been looking at the GI tract the last few weeks. Liver, pancreas, all those other bits there in the abdomen seem like a sensible next step. So with the liver, we'll talk about the functions, except we won't really talk about the functions because that's kind of a physiologist's job, not an anatomist's job. And it's got about 500 different functions, so we'd be here all day just talking about that. But we'll briefly talk about the functions. Um, we'll talk about the parts of the liver. We'll talk about um, the connective tissue that the liver is within and the ligaments that form because of it, which generally explains how the liver is held in place. And then we'll talk about the blood supply, the blood that goes to the liver and how the blood gets out of the liver and why that's particularly important in relation to the liver. Um, and we'll talk about bile. Um, and then we'll have a look at the microscopic anatomy of the liver and relate the microscopic anatomy to the gross anatomy. So that's my main aim for today is to link the microscopic and gross anatomy together, right? So we have this thing where we can see these big structures, but we can't see the microscopic structures inside an organ. But in terms of structure, those different scales are all interrelated, they all work together, right? It's just our eye that limits our thinking and our understanding. If you link the microscopic anatomy with the gross anatomy, it's better for you. It all makes so much more sense and it all links together and it becomes obvious, all right? So that's my main aim. So here's the liver. We can just about see it. And if, you're not, if you haven't looked at the liver before, in the human anatomy, it might be a little bit higher than you were expecting. Um, the liver is, look, it's largely protected by the ribs. It's up in the rib cage here. Here's the liver, here's the stomach. Um, this is the tenth rib down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that costal margin that you can feel down here is, um, oh, ah, what's that lump there? Ooh, the eleventh rib. Oh, um, so this costal margin you can see down here is the um, is the tenth rib, and then this costal cartilage around here. So the liver, if we think about the surface anatomy, if I take this off, can you see how look the liver? It's kind of triangular shaped in its entirety, and the lowest part here. So if we think about the mid axillary line, so if we think about you know the mid axillary line, which is a line from the axilla down the mid bit. Anyway, down here, the liver, the inferior kind of edge corner of the liver gets down to about the level of the 10th rib and then it ascends. It's about as high as kind of if the nipples are about here, it's, it's kind of a little bit lower than the level of the nipples, maybe around what? One, two, three, four, and the fifth rib. Something like that, the fifth or the fifth intercostal space up there somewhere. A little bit, little bit lower than that anteriorly. <gasps> But of course, the height of the liver changes because, look, here's the diaphragm. So the dome of the diaphragm here is filled by the, the liver. So as you breathe in, of course, you flatten your diaphragm, so you push the liver down. And as you breathe out and the diaphragm relaxes and comes back up again, the liver gets higher and lower and higher and lower, right? Because the liver is attached to the diaphragm. We'll come back to that later. But this means that in terms of surface anatomy, if we go from about the 10th rib in the mid axillary line up diagonally across to the other side of the chest, you know, kind of around the fifth intercostal space, just a little bit lower than the nipples, then back across to the other side, that's kind of the space that the liver takes up. It's a very large organ. It's the second largest organ in the body after the skin. That's always a popular pub quiz question, isn't it? The largest organ in the body. It's the integumentary system, the skin. Um, it weighs about a kilo and a half in adults, something like that. Of course, it varies, but around a kilo and a half. Um, it's absolutely vital for life. It's like I said, it's got 500 odd functions um, and, and most of those functions are done by the liver and nothing else. So it's incredibly important. The good news is that if the liver gets damaged or you lose a bit of it, or if you have a tumor in the liver, which is very common because the association of the GI tract, we'll come back to that as well in a minute then if you cut away part of the liver, the liver magically regenerates itself. You can cut away a lot of the liver and it'll regenerate over several months and it'll, it'll go back to its original size. Um, if you keep doing that though, it won't do it forever. Um, 
So the liver is really good at regenerating. And of course, being covered by the ribs means it's protected by the ribs, but also if it's covered by the ribs, then, then trauma that fractures the ribs on this side could damage the liver on this side. Also, if, you're, if you want to biopsy a liver, if you want to stick a needle in there and take a needle biopsy, then you know where you want to be. You're looking for the 10th the rib and you're going to go above there to find the liver. So it's important then if you're thinking about the surface anatomy of the lungs and the liver, to relate the two. So the liver is not normally palpable. You can't normally palpate it very easily because it's below the ribs. But if, if somebody breathes in very deeply, then that's going to push the diaphragm down and push the liver down. And you might be able to palpate the, the liver as it gets pushed below that costal cartilage there. But otherwise, the rest of the time, it's up here. It's well protected. We can see this gap here underneath the xiphoid process there. You can see we've got this lab set up today for an exam that we're going to run on Monday, which is why I'm in here, because we've got students in the main lab revising, which is, as I always say, very nice. So what does the liver do? An important concept is that all of the blood from the GI tract passes to the liver and then it goes back to the systemic circulation. So the blood passing from the GI tract to the liver is called the portal um, circulation. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. But what that means is that the liver is seeing all of those great things that you've digested and absorbed across the small intestine and what have you into the blood supply. So the liver metabolizes carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, It'll metabolize um, toxins like alcohol. It'll break down that sort of thing. It'll be the first thing to see drugs that get ingested. It's also going to store some of the glycogen, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals. It's going to make bile, which goes into the duodenum and helps emulsify fats, gives them more surface area for other things to break down those fats to make fatty acids and stuff like that. It, um, in the bile then, so it's recycling red blood cells, it's recycling erythrocytes, and so one of the bits that can't be recycled is the heme group, so the heme group gets broken down, you get bilirubin, bilirubin is the yellow pigment that you get associated with, with jaundice, right, yellowing of the skin in association with liver, Loss, uh, liver dysfunction, loss of liver function. So bilirubin is a yellow pigment, um, so normally the bilirubin gets put into the bile and then goes into the duodenum and gets excreted. That gives the bile its green color because it mixes with other things. And also that bilirubin gets metabolized by other bacteria in the gut to form stercobilin, which makes feces brown. Fact of the day, right? <laughs> That's why your feces are brown, it's because of the bilirubin from your liver. Um, it makes angiotensinogen, which affects the kidneys and regulates blood pressure. It makes um, blood clotting proteins. It makes albumin, which is important in osmosis and stuff, physiology things, um, and hundreds of other things that are just as useful. So your liver is really important to you. The liver has four lobes. The biggest lobe is the right lobe here, and then there's the left lobe. The other two lobes, we can't see anteriorly, Turn the liver around and you can see this lobe here, so there's the gallbladder, right? There's the gallbladder and there's a lobe next to it. That's the quadrate lobe, quadrate, you know, like square shaped. And then this is the, the chordate lobe up here. And the chordate lobe, well, chordate means tail. It doesn't really look like a tail though, but chordate, quadrate, and that's on the posterior surface. That means that's the left lobe and that's the right lobe, right? Turn it around, right lobe, left lobe. So you can see how, look, how the liver is wrapped around the inferior vena cava. So it is intimately associated with the inferior vena cava. And all of the blood that's going through the liver is going out into the inferior vena cava. And so the gallbladder sat next to it. The gallbladder is a story for another time. Now the liver is attached to other things. Which makes sense if you've got this kilo and a half thing inside you. You kind of want it to be anchored, don't you? Um, and we can see some of these reflections on here, these bits of connective tissue. Now, to better understand all these ligaments and how all this works, we need to go back to the embryo, like we usually do. Um, and we'll consider mesentery and stuff. So, right, 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 so, so, 
this is a stomach. <laughs> so when the stomach is forming in the embryo, it's, it's attached to the posterior abdominal wall by a dorsal mesentery, that, that serous membrane that's lining the abdominal wall, right? You know this, it, it comes out on either side, covers the stomach, so there's two layers, that forms the mesentery. And, um, and then the liver, so then there's also, at the level of the stomach, there's also a ventral mesentery. We like to call this the ventral mesogastrium and the dorsal mesogastrium because this is at the level of the stomach. Mesogastrium, gaster stomach, right? So the ventral mesogastrium then is actually anchoring the future stomach to the anterior abdominal wall. And the dorsal mesogastrium is anchoring the future stomach to the posterior abdominal wall. So we've got a sheet on either side. And then in that ventral mesogastrium here, we get a little bud forming, which is the hepatic diverticulum, diverticulum meaning little bud, <laughs> and hate poaching. And that hepatic diverticulum grows into that double layer of mesentery. And then it grows and grows and grows, gets really, really big and bing, it forms the liver. Now, let's consider that with cling film. Okay, so stomach, liver, mesentery. All right, so we've got the posterior abdominal wall here. The mesentery goes out around the stomach, around the liver, goes to the anterior abdominal wall here and then it comes we actually need a little bit of there comes back again over these two uh, right and then it goes back to the posterior abdominal wall so now we've got a double a double layer thickness of serous membrane forming the mesentery right so what we've got is we've got our our stomach and our liver, all right, and this mesentery stuck together, so it's a two-layered mesentery, and that's all holding it in place in the abdomen. And the stomach and the liver develop, and then they come together, and they kind of sit like that in us, which means that that sheet of mesentery between the stomach and the liver, that's the lesser omentum, right? So the space behind it is the lesser sac. But you can see how the liver becomes covered by that same serous membrane, that visceral peritoneum. And then anteriorly, some of that still attaches to the anterior abdominal wall, right, around here. So the liver is anchored in place by the peritoneum attaching to the anterior abdominal wall, which is what we see here. And that is the falciform ligament. Now, this being the ventral mesogastrium, there's something else that's forming here. And at this level, there's also this thing. And this would be the septum transversum. So the septum transversum is going to eventually divide the thorax from the abdomen. The embryo originally has this large single space within it. And the septum transversum kind of blends a bit with the ventral mesogastrium. Uh, and the liver kind of forms in the lower part, the inferior part of the septum transversum and the ventral mesogastrium. So it's all a bit complicated, but essentially what you're getting at is you're getting this T shape of connective tissue, right? So you've got ventral mesogastrium, septum transversum, and these two things are stuck together. That's gonna to form the diaphragm, and that's gonna form the ligaments that hold the liver in place. So when we take this apart, when we look at the liver, in the person, in the cadaver, in the models, we find, see this line here, this is the falciform ligament, anchoring the ligament to the anterior abdominal wall, so that's a remnant of that mesentery. Um, and then we see this shape of ligament here. So this is the anterior liver, this is the falciform ligament. And if we look at the superior surface, we see this shape. So this is the bare area of the liver, because it doesn't have any peritoneum on it. All this shiny stuff, is this is visceral peritoneum covering the liver from the ventral mesogastrium and the septum transversum. And if we look posteriorly, we find this here. So this connective tissue here is anchoring the liver to the diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is sat on top of it. So this is called, these are the, the coronary ligaments. And we have anterior and posterior coronary ligaments. And look, when they, see where they come together as a point? 
This is where they get called the triangular ligaments, here and over here, right? So triangular ligament, yeah, and triangular ligament posteriorly. So these are the connective tissue sheets holding the liver in place. And they're not really ligaments, they just get called ligaments because they're kind of, they're a bit thicker where they're attaching to other things, right? So if that's the falciform ligament, then these are the coronary ligaments here, right? These bits on top. Let me take this off. So the coronary ligaments then are anchoring the liver to the diaphragm. You can see why they get called the coronary ligaments because they're really, really close to the heart. So these are all coronary ligaments. You might talk about anterior coronary ligaments over here and then posterior coronary ligaments further around. We have left and right triangular ligaments. So if this is the, the right side, then we have to look on the posterior liver to see you see that triangular shape there? That's the right triangular ligament. And then this is in its normal position. See this here? This is the left triangular ligament on the, on the superior surface of the kidney. And these are all formed by the, the two sheets of peritoneum, the two sheets of visceral peritoneum going around the liver. Did I say kidney earlier? the two sheets of visceral peritoneum going around the liver and anchoring it to the anterior abdominal wall and then going around it and attaching it to the diaphragm superiorly. So that's why we see the shiny stuff being the visceral peritoneum and then this area here and here being called the bare area because there's no visceral peritoneum there because the visceral peritoneum is going over and then attaching it to the diaphragm and over and attaching it to the diaphragm and over and attaching it to the anterior abdominal wall and stuff. Does that make sense? So that's, those are what, that's what the triangular ligaments are and the coronary ligaments and the falciform ligament. Now the cool thing about the falciform ligament is like down at the bottom here we see the round ligament or ligamentum teres. Now this used to be the umbilical vein, right? So umbilicus is here. We used to have two umbilical arteries going out. We used to have an umbilical vein coming back in from the placenta and that was carrying all the oxygen and all the nutrients and stuff. And that would carry the blood into the abdomen and then the, the, the uh, umbilical vein would run up to the liver so that blood would then get processed by the liver and then go into the inferior vena cava and off around the body. There is actually um, there's a ductus venosus, another blood vessel around here which you can often find and in the fetus the ductus venosus took about half of the blood from the umbilical vein and it went around the liver and into the inferior vena cava. So only about half of the blood coming in from the placenta um, gets acted on by the liver. The other half can go straight through and bypass it and go off to the brain and stuff like that. See what I mean? Cool. So the round ligament or ligamentum teres is the, is the remnant of the umbilical vein and it's right here at the base of the falciform ligament but it's going in that way. While we're talking about the liver and the diaphragm, do you guys go running? I go running. You might have seen some of my videos where I go running. I like running. I'm doing a lot of running at the moment. Anyway, running. Um, when you go running, um, of course, as you're breathing in and out, your diaphragm is going up and down. And as your diaphragm is going up and down, your liver is attached to your diaphragm. So your liver is also going up and down because it's being displaced by the diaphragm, it's going up and down, but also the liver's hanging off the diaphragm. You're bouncing up and down, the liver's hanging off the diaphragm by these ligaments that we've been talking about. Have you ever had a stitch while running? Which side do you get a stitch? So a, pain, a stitch when running usually means you like pain around here somewhere. Which side do you get a stitch in when you run? Um, when I talk to people about this, most people say that they get a stitch on the right side and they sometimes say on the left side. And sometimes those people associate getting a stitch on the left side with like drinking a lot of water before they go for a run or after a meal. Something that's kind of enlarged the stomach because look, the stomach's over on the left side. But look, the liver also extends over to the left side. So it may be the case that when you get a stitch when you're running, it's because the diaphragm is hanging, sorry, it's because the liver is hanging off the diaphragm and is bouncing up and down and is irritating the diaphragm. What do you think about that? Could be, right? Um, if people keep running through a stitch, sometimes they say that the pain goes up to the shoulder, which seems like a different type of pain. But it's probably the same pain, isn't it? Because the, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve 
C345 keeps the diaphragm alive, right? The, C the phrenic nerve comes from the neck and descends down through the thorax to innervate the diaphragm. And visceral afferents or pain fibers pass from the diaphragm. Vis are they visceral afferents in the diaphragm? They just, anyway. Sensory innervation from the diaphragm passes also up the phrenic nerves and back into the neck. So it's, it seems like this is a form of referred pain, whereas the pain is actually here at the diaphragm. The diaphragm has been irritated, but the brain isn't used to receiving pain from those parts of the diaphragm, whereas it is used to receiving pain from structures around the shoulder. And because those sensory nerves are entering the spinal cord at the same level, it assumes the pain is up in the shoulder rather than in the diaphragm. And then if you keep running, usually your pain goes away. I don't know why, but most of you probably when you get a stitch you stop running and you walk it off, right? Which is probably very sensible. So what about the blood supply to the liver? Right, well, we've got some really cool stuff going on here. Take the heart out. Um, liver, stomach. Now, the liver has formed from the foregut. So the liver is going to be supplied with blood by the artery of the foregut, which is the celiac trunk. So here's the celiac trunk here. Um, the aorta is a little bit hidden there. If I take that away, you can see the aorta. So the aorta is just popping out from under the diaphragm. Um, and then the celiac trunk comes off. And the celiac trunk is going to supply blood to the spleen, the pancreas, the duodenum, the stomach. And we see the common hepatic artery coming off and giving off a number of those branches to other organs in this area. Um, and then that becomes the hepatic artery proper when it goes off towards the liver. And then the hepatic artery proper splits into two left and right hepatic arteries, which goes to those, those two main lobes and then gives off lots and lots of branches to all the other lobes and bits and bobs. That's how the liver is supplied with oxygenated blood, with the blood that the other organs of the body typically sees, right? And probably about 25% of the blood that the liver sees is from the common hepatic artery. That number might be a bit woolly, it might vary a little bit. Now the other way in which the um, liver receives blood is from the portal vein. Now the portal vein is not a typical vein, so a typical vein carries blood from a capillary bed back to the heart. The portal vein is carrying blood from the capillary beds of the gastrointestinal tract, the small intestine, the large intestine, to the liver. And then that blood goes through the liver and then into the inferior vena cava and then up to the heart and off around the body. So the portal vein is very, very special. The portal vein is, is, is the inferior vena cava there. Um, the portal vein is, <laughs> all right, so we see, here's the portal vein here. The portal vein is formed when the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein join. And the inferior mesenteric vein is already joined with the splenic vein before that point. So essentially the portal vein is the splenic vein, inferior mesenteric vein and superior mesenteric vein all coming together. If you see what I mean. All the, all, so the portal vein is receiving blood from the splenic vein, inferior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric vein. And then it passes that blood to the liver. Now the reason we can't see it here is because like in most models, we've taken away the connective tissue. If I said that the, the lesser omentum was uh, this connective tissue sheet between the liver and the stomach, right? You pull the liver and the stomach apart and you see the, the lesser omentum. This free edge here, that's where you find the common hepatic artery, well, that's where you find the hepatic artery proper and the portal vein and the bile duct going the other way back to the duodenum, right? So, if you cut these two, pull them apart, and then look, there's the lesser omentum. Oh, bloody hell, I'm getting a right mess, aren't I? The lesser omentum's here, and the free edge of the lesser omentum, that's where the portal vein is. Clear as mud. So the portal vein is carrying all of the blood from the GI tract back to the liver. So it's a vein that's only around, what, eight centimeters long, but it's absolutely crucial to liver function and to life. So that blood from the portal vein and the hepatic artery proper goes into the liver, floods through the liver, so then about 75% of that blood is from the portal vein, goes through the liver and then drains into the inferior vena cava, and look, the inferior vena, look, the part and the liver, they're right next to each other. So that blood goes into the inferior vena cava and boop, straight into the right atrium. It's right there. These things are really close to one another. So now then if we look at the microscopic anatomy, 
within the liver, we see this arrangement of liver lobules. And those liver lobules are classically described as having a hexagonal shape. Mm, they're a bit tricky to make out on these sections, on these slides. Uh, if you get the right bit and use your imagination, you can kind of see them. You can work out where they are because you see a central vein and the central vein is in the middle of that hexagon. And then on the outer edge of that hexagon, you find these triads of three vessels. And those three vessels are tiny branches of the hepatic artery proper, tiny branches of the portal vein, and tiny branches of the biliary system. So the blood from those tiny branches of the hepatic artery and of the portal vein are supplying blood to each liver lobule. Now if we look at the tissue, we see there's loads and loads of hepatocytes in there. Those are the main cells of the liver. They're all doing all those hundreds of functions that the liver does. And in between those hepatocytes, you can kind of see corridors, spaces, and those corridors are sinusoids. And the sinusoids are lined with endothelial cells like capillary beds, and they're fenestrated, so they're very leaky corridors, which means that the blood, all that blood, that huge volume of blood, from the portal vein and the hepatic artery flow across the liver lobule through those sinusoids. So the hepatocytes can act upon all of the nutrients and alcohol and toxins and drugs and uh, erythrocytes and all that stuff in the blood that's flowing past them and flowing through them. They can act on the blood as it goes past. That blood will then pass to the center of the liver lobule, to that central vein. It'll drain out through the central vein and that will eventually drain back to the inferior vena cava. Now the hepatocytes are making bile. That bile is going to flow in the opposite direction, back to the tiny vessel of the biliary, tr biliary tree and then out towards the uh, common bile duct and get stored in the gallbladder, right? But you can see from the microscopic anatomy how all of the liver looks like this. It's very homogenous. It all looks the same. It's very even. It's all set up for a huge amount of blood to flow across these microscopic corridors, across the hepatocytes and into the inferior vena cava. And you can also see in those sections of liver, very little connective tissue. There's some connective tissue there, giving the liver a little bit of shape, but that shows that there's very little connective tissue, which explains why the liver is very soft uh, and can be damaged quite easily. But it's, as I said, it's generally well protected by the ribs. Um, now, all of that blood passing from the GI tract and the hepatic, common hepatic artery, through the liver has got to get back to the systemic circulation. Now, if you, if you have um, a disease of the liver, such as um, cirrhosis of the liver, so cirrhosis of the, liver, of the liver is typically caused by long-term alcoholism, drinking large amounts of alcohol regularly for decades. And the liver is very good at regenerating itself, but it can only do that to a limited effect. And as it keeps regenerating and regenerating, it starts to lay down more connective tissue, more fibrous tissue. And if we look at a section of, of liver um, which has cirrhosis, you can see that a lot of that, a lot of those channels that the blood flowed through has gone and has been replaced by fibrous connective tissue. So that huge volume of blood that's flowing from the GI tract through the liver has got to get back to the systemic circulation somehow. And in that sort of liver, it's very difficult for all that blood to flow through the liver. It gets, uh, yeah, the pressure, the resistance to flow increases. So the blood finds alternate routes to get back to the systemic circulation without all going through the liver. And the roots it finds are, there are five of them, and these are called the portosystemic anastomoses. That is a topic for another day, but in somebody with a cirrhosis of the liver, you will see esophageal varices, right? So if you look down the esophagus, you'll see swollen veins in the lower esophagus. You may see swollen veins in the anal canal, hemorrhoids or piles, and you may see swollen veins around the umbilicus in the, in the skin, caput medusae, Medusa's head, Medusa's hair, right? So those distended veins are three of the portosystemic anastomoses that you can see 
if blood, instead of flowing through the liver, is flowing in the wrong direction and across some anastomoses, some connecting veins, back into systemic vessels. Kulha, anatomy. And that's what kills late-stage alcoholics. Um, hematemesis, so vomiting blood, um, is usually then seen in late-stage alcoholism because those veins in the lower esophagus that are carrying blood back to the systemic circulation in a way that they wouldn't normally do, distend and distend and burst and rupture and suddenly you've got bleeding in the esophagus which is very difficult to stop. Very, very dangerous, that's a medical emergency. Um, veins of course don't have muscular walls so they, they distend and they're quite weak. Alright then, there you go, the anatomy of the liver. When you think anatomy, don't just think the big chunky things, think the microscopic and the big chunky things and link it all together. It's all the same stuff. The only, only limitation is the resolution of your eyeballs, which is artificial. Okay, so anatomy of the liver. Related to function and dysfunction and stuff. Anyway, uh, there are a few more things to look at in the abdomen. Maybe we'll do those next week. All right, see you next time.